Thank you. Good morning. I'm Chris. I'm one of the members of the congregation here at Christ Church. How are you all doing? I'm, I'm very much looking forward to talking to you this morning. And I've got a question to start with. How will the world end? Have you ever wondered that? God's answer to that question is quite extraordinary. Not with Putin pressing the nuclear button or a planet engulfed in a final climate meltdown or America electing a madman as real as those threats might feel. Not as T.S. Eliot had it, with a whimper or even a bang. No, it turns out the world ends in a party, a celebration, a feast, a banquet. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to get your party gear on. I don't know, some of you may be wearing it. Some of you are not. Uh, and, uh, no, you're looking very smart, because that's, that's where we're heading. God is throwing a party. And guess what? Everyone is invited. Nearly 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah has a stunning vision of this party at the end of the world. It's in chapter 5, so let me read it to you because we read Luke 14. I promise you we're coming to that in a moment. Isaiah says this, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich foods for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. A party at the end of the world. And did you notice, by the way, Isaiah says, the finest of wines will be served. I'm particularly excited at that idea as someone who lives squarely in the £8.50 a bottle world of wine when I go to Sainsbury's. £7.50 if it's on offer. Not the top shelf as you know, where it's 13 or 14 pounds a bottle. I'm not a madman. Not the bottom shelf, five pounds. I've got standards. <laughs> Eight pound 50 is where I'm at. But the really important thing I want you to notice about the party that Isaiah sees in his vision is that all people are invited. Everyone can come, the whole global family. And no one is coming as a servant. No one is coming as a second-class citizen. They are all honored guests. And at this banquet, hosted by God himself, sadness will melt away, shame will be wiped from our experience, and the goodness and joy and abundance and companionship of God and his people will cause all those who come to the feast to say, surely this is our God. Unfortunately, the people who objected to this vision the most turned out to be the Israelites themselves. In fact, basically, ever since that day, the people of God, whether that's Israel or even at times the church, have been trying to find ways to make the party more exclusive. No sooner than Isaiah had uttered his vision, the Israelites began revising his words. What he really meant, they said, by all people was us, not the Gentiles. They're not invited. 
Then, believe it or not, they excluded anyone with physical disabilities. Why would God want them at the feast, they figured? All peoples didn't mean all people, surely. Another source, the book of Enoch, just get your head around this, is even worse. In that version, they believed that the Gentiles do come to dine at God's table, but it's a trick. And the angel of death appears to kill them. And the true believers triumphantly wade through their blood to get to the table to sit with the Messiah. It's not just exclusive, but malevolent. And by the time of Jesus, therefore, the prevailing view was that what Isaiah really meant by all people was God's chosen people, which was conveniently them. So we come to Luke 14. Now, we didn't read the whole chapter, but the context is Jesus is having dinner with a Pharisee and a group of religious leaders. He's already had a go at them earlier in the chapter for jostling up between themselves to get the best places around the table. Now, you've just got to understand this. In first century culture, every meal like this was arranged with a strict seating pan based on importance. Basically a bit like we would do for a wedding today. You know, the, the family and the most important people on top table, and then you are stuck with an obscure aunt at the other end of the room. I've been there. This is what it was like in first century uh, Israel for every meal. This was a culture obsessed with status and who was in and who was out. If you were in, you were revered, you had celebrity status, but if you were out, you were cancelled. So I was reading that, I was thinking just suddenly this first century world seems to resonate, doesn't it, more with our culture than we might expect, where status matters, where you can get cancelled at a moment's notice. So we have that in common. In the midst of the argument about who should sit in the most important seats, one of the Pharisees present, this is just coming into the bit that we've read, makes reference to what I'm talking about this morning, the final banquet at the end of the world. This is how he starts this passage. Blessed is the one who will eat in the feast of the kingdom of God. In other words, never mind this meal and who's sitting where. The big question is, he says, who's invited to the final banquet? Like others, he had conveniently forgotten Isaiah has already answered this question. So in response, Jesus tells the parable that we're looking at today, and it is a stunning, brilliant, subversive story. He says, to begin with, a man holds a great banquet, and he invites many people, a wide-open invitation. I think it helps at this point to have a bit of an insight into how they did things at this time. The first invitation would have gone out many days in advance of the banquet, and people would have accepted it at that point. On the day of the banquet itself, of course, there's a huge amount of preparation. Animals are going to be slaughtered and then cooked over an open fire. So it's, it's not an exact science, and it, it takes... Uh, It takes time. There's no electric ovens with timers. You can't say, can you be there 7 for 7.15? It doesn't work like that. So it would be normal practice as the food nears readiness to send out a message to those who've accepted the invitation to say that everything is ready and to come. Notice it's only at this point that people start making their excuses. So these are people who accepted the invitation, but who wait until the last moment to say they're not coming. That's basically the equivalent of you hosting a party today and someone turning up at your house to the dinner you're hosting. Maybe they're sitting in your living room having some nibbles, as we'd like to call them, and a glass of wine, eight pound 50 wine, I hope. And then when everyone's ready, you ask people to come through and sit at the table. You're like, ready, the food's on the table. And at that point, they make their excuse and leave. Can you get a sense of the insult 
going on here. And so each of these guests in Jesus' story makes their excuse, and it's worth just taking a bit of a look at them. The first says, I've just brought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. That's ridiculous. In the Middle East, buying land is a long process that often takes over a year. Before you spend money on it, you would take months looking at every aspect. The sunlight, the soil, the yield. Only when you've seen it through the seasons and were satisfied would you actually buy it. So to say that you've just bought it and now you must go and see it is a direct insult. The second says, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. This is exactly the same. You would never buy oxen without looking at them over a period of weeks or months. You test them out, you check their health and well-being and only then buy them. Before you've bought them, like this man, you've, you've basically tried them out many times. So this is a direct insult to the host. It's not subtle. That's what, again, is sort of going on. Imagine I'm sitting at your, in your living room, sipping a glass of wine. We know what type. And snacking on the bowl of crisps you put out. You're, you come through from the kitchen, and you've been coming to and fro, and finally you come through and you say, Okay, we're ready. Let's go through to the dining table and sit down. And I say, oh, hang on a minute. I've got decorators coming in next month, and I have to choose the paint color. I've got to go. That's the level of insult here. The final guest is the most insulting. I've got married. I can't come. He does not even ask to be excused. It's a blatantly offensive and vulgar way of declining an invitation. But there's even more to this. Jesus is giving us the story of three guests, not one. Have you ever wondered why? Because the point could sort of be made by one guest. But think about it. If one guest backs out, the banquet can proceed. But if there's collusion between the guests and they all withdraw together, the banquet will not be able to go ahead. This isn't just a ploy to avoid the party. It's a plan to stop it altogether. Notice what happens next. The host is angry, and the story actually tells us that in verse 21. And for good reason. The insult is deep and personal. The anger is justified. But the anger of the host is turned into energetic grace. He decides the places at the table will not be left empty and his generosity will not go to waste. So he sends his servants out to invite others to the feast. Now, does that in any way sound familiar to you this morning? Jesus is telling us a story with profound resonance to the gospel. Justified anger turns into energetic grace. And so the servants head out to invite others. And notice there are two rounds to this new invitation. The first is to those in the town who've not been invited, specifically the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Remember the first reaction of the Israelites to Isaiah's vision. This is not meant for anyone with a physical disability. But the gospel is richer and deeper than that. This is what we celebrate here today. Not an exclusive gospel reserved just for those whom we choose, who we like, or who sound and look the same of us as us, or are not too demanding. This is a gospel for all. Everyone is invited. The second round goes even further. Notice the first round is in the town. The second round is beyond the town, beyond those who you might even know by sight. Outside the town would be thieves and those with infectious diseases, those who were shunned, and unwelcome in the town. 
But the invitation extends to them as well. Just for a moment here, you might want to look in verse 23 at that word compel. Because it doesn't mean, just to explain, that people are being forced. They're not being basically frog-marched to the dinner table. Actually, that's quite important to understand. In this culture, where hospitality and shame run deep, you could not accept an invitation that you could not reciprocate. So if you're invited to a feast but have nothing to give in return, in this culture, you must say no. So that's why his host says to his servants that they have to persuade them. That's actually a better translation, I think, than compel. You have to get them to come anyway because there's nothing you need to bring to this party. It's by grace that you enter. This is, this is beautiful, isn't it? There's something going on quite remarkable in this passage. And it was hard, if not impossible, for those listening to Jesus, the Pharisees, to hear. By the way, that last verse, 24, is generally understood not to be part of the parable, but to be Jesus talking to the host of the meal about those listening to him around the table. But don't get comfortable this morning, because I think this parable is asking something of us too. Like the Israelites, I'm afraid, we can all too easily find ways to exclude others from the invitation. Talking over the last few months to those with various disabilities, whether that's physical or neurological, they would sadly tell us that, is that the reality is that they often feel cut out of the church today and excluded. When was the last time you saw someone in a wheelchair preaching or leading a service? We have to do better at this. Mother Teresa was once asked, what's the biggest problem in the world today? And she answered without hesitation, the biggest problem in the world today is that we draw the circle of our family too small. We need to draw it larger every day. We live in a world that is increasingly partisan and divided, politically, socially, economically, theologically. We live in a world where people are canceled at the drop of a hat, where status is prized, but the gospel offers us a different vision of the future. Inclusion, not exclusion. Everyone is invited as guests. I wonder who you will find yourself sitting to, next to at this feast. But, final thought, the parable is also a call for us as servants to invite people to the party. The parable kind of reminds us, I think, that we've been sent out by God to share his invitation to the banquet. This mission is not an add-on to the Christian life. It is our Christian life. It's who we are. And as I've thought about that, I know I am often very, very slow to share my faith. And I, I suspect some of you will feel the same. It's difficult, embarrassing, it's awkward in a culture that feels more and more indifferent to Christianity to have the courage to step out. But my embarrassment and awkwardness is not how God sees it. You get this beautiful sense in this parable of the heart of God. The instruction to the servants going out is to invite everyone. Did you catch that? So that my house would be full. God longs for heaven to be full of all humanity. And this is a challenge, I think, not just for us as individuals, but as a church. Speaking of lots of different churches, I see many caught up in just maintaining themselves with no energy or time to reach out. Our mission, though, is to share this invitation, not just with those who turn up to a service, but with those who might assume they are not welcome or they wouldn't fit in or that their needs are too great. And I wonder whether Lent provides us with an opportunity as individuals and as a church to hear the call of the Father to live more missionally. And perhaps the best thing of all is the message that we're sharing. This is the gospel. God is holding a party 
and you're invited. By the way, thank goodness God is running this party himself and he's not asking us to organize it. I'm very glad about that. I was thinking this week of one preacher, this I think was early on in my Christian faith, who said with total delight that heaven, this great party, was going to be like an eternal church service. And I remember thinking right then, given patchy experience of church services, good and bad, at different churches over the years, this does not sound very appealing. A service that lasts for eternity. It's bad enough when it goes past one o'clock. No. This is a better party than we could organize. It's God's party. And he is the God of uproarious laughter, full bellies, and second helpings. And you know what? There's not a bottle of £8.50 wine in sight. Amen. Shall we pray as we close? Lord, we thank you for this invitation to the party that came first to us and now goes to the whole of the world. We ask individually, corporately, that you would renew us in our vision, in our courage, in our love to reach out beyond even those we know to bring your hope and your party to all who need it. In Jesus' name, amen.